All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our workshop today on uh, family PNG and the uh, evaluation uh, of six years of work that uh, Judy Putt has done. My name is Stephen Howes, and I'm the director of the Development Policy Centre, but I'm also the chair of Family PNG, and uh, it's my uh, honour to uh, be the chair of this of this seminar and to welcome you. Uh, so let's begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all meeting. And uh, in my case, that's the Ngunnawal people here in Canberra. Let us pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, so this evaluation is something that, um, you know, I guess uh, collectively we've been working on for a long time and uh, have been wanting to present. And, uh, you know, of course, COVID's delayed everything, but it's great that we've um, got to this point that we're able to, it's been out in the public for a while, and uh, we've been able to arrange uh, this seminar to share it with you all. Uh, so the main, uh, our main speaker today, of course, is uh, Judy Putt. And uh, Dr. Judy Putt is the author of this evaluation. And she's also a research fellow at the Department of Pacific Affairs at the ANU. She has extensive uh, experience, uh, both uh, from the time of her uh, studies, uh, right through her extensive research uh, on domestic and family violence issues, uh, criminal justice, and the intersection between those two. And she's a long serving board member and um, past chair of the ACT Domestic Violence Crisis Service. So we're really grateful that, to Judy that she took on this job of the evaluation and that she's presenting it uh, here today. Uh, we're also hoping to bring you um, a couple of our senior managers from Family PNG. Uh, Daisy Planner is our CEO, and Denga Ilave is our operations director. I think they're having a bit of trouble logging in from PNG, so we decided we'd make a start because we've got, you know, we've got a good turnout, and we don't want to keep people waiting. Uh, so depending on when they join, um, you know, that's when they'll uh, contribute. And uh, we've also, I meant to have the uh, PNG High Commissioner, uh, John Carley, who's a great supporter of Family PNG. In fact, he's our patron. But I think John might also be having a few internet issues. So again, we'll bring you, bring him to you uh, when, he, when he joins. Um, but with uh, Denga uh, not being here yet, is that right, Ari? Denga hasn't joined, right? Yeah, okay. So maybe I'll just um, give you a bit of a, introduction to Family PNG, uh, which Denga was going to do, and she can give her remarks uh, at the end. So Family PNG uh, is a Papua New Guinean NGO, a pup, a re registered in PNG and uh, based in PNG. Uh, all our staff, except for the CEO of Papua New Guinean, and the board is a mix of Papua New Guineans and Australians. And uh, we got off the ground in um, around 2013, and we started in Lai, where we set up this case management center that ever since its inception has been dedicated to providing whatever support uh, survivors of domestic violence or family sexual violence need. Uh, since that time, we've, um, we still have our main center and head office in Lai, but we're also now operating in Port Moresby as part of the Belisi Initiative, which is a, um, a public-private partnership has both public funding and private funding for a another case management center and also a safe house. And uh, most recently, we've opened an office in uh, Goroka, so moving uh, into the Highlands. So it's been a busy period, um, but we asked Judy in uh, this evaluation to focus on the lay operations because that's been going since 2014, and we think you know we've got the, enough time. Uh, both to warrant a evaluation and to you know really bring out some interesting findings uh, from it. So this uh, evaluation is focused on our on our lay operations. Uh, you know whatever we've um, achieved or tried to achieve uh, certainly couldn't do on our own. And I just want to thank uh, at the outset all our supporters, uh, large and small. Actually, I know a number of our supporters uh, are here today. Uh, so thank you very much. You know if you are. Uh, either you, you provide technical support or you you're, uh, provide financial support or, or some people provide both. 
Uh, that's both individuals. Uh, we also have some very generous support from um, organizations. I think Angus White is here from uh, the Mundango Foundation. They'll be one of our longest standing uh, supporters uh, from Australia. And uh, definitely we couldn't have uh, got where we are without support from the Australian government. Uh, so in particular through the Pacific Women Shaping Pacific Development Program, Australian government is our biggest supporter and we're really grateful uh, for that uh, financial long-term support that has really been crucial in what we've been doing. Uh, well, you'll find out a lot more about Family PNG uh, from Judy's evaluation. Uh, it's up on the web uh, website, uh, so please uh, have a look at it, but I think you'll get you know, great insight into it from Judy. So I think that's enough for me and uh, I'll hand over to Judy. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, traditional, traditional custodians of the land of the in, in, in terms of where I am, it is the Ngunnawal people, but wherever you might be. I also want to thank um, Stephen, Fiona, um, Ari for um, providing this opportunity to talk about the evaluation. And I'm just really sorry I'm not having a chance to see Dana and Daisy again. They do turn up. So I, I've only been allocated 10 minutes, so I'll try not to rush, but I'll also try to stick to the time limit. I do have a presentation which is designed to summarise the, uh, the findings of the evaluation. Now, it is a very long and detailed report, and at the end of the presentation, you'll see the link to the report. So if, there's, if you want to get a much better sense of both um, what APNG has done over the past six years or seven years now, um, and, and what the evaluation revealed, I really would um, urge you to ring that, uh, ring that, read that. Anyway, I'll share my screen now. So Judy, just uh, so I don't interrupt you once you get going, mm -hmm. uh, I'll say that now uh, Daisy is joined. So welcome, oh, Daisy's our CEO. So she can uh, give some comments after your presentation and she may be with Denga or Denga may also join. And we also do have the uh, Papua New Guinea High Commissioner of Australia, uh, John Carley. So thank you, John, for joining. And uh, we look forward to your, as I mentioned, John's actually our patron. Uh, we look forward to your remarks at the end of our seminar. And just to everyone who's here, I should have said this before, but um, I mean, Judy was just complaining. She hasn't got much time to present, but um, <laughs> we want to, um, he got up to 15 minutes, Judy, but we want to give people time to ask questions and uh, give comments. So please do. This is a, a Zoom seminar. So feel free to put your comments, yeah. questions in the chat function or to raise your hand and uh, we'll take questions after Judy's given her presentation. All right. Back to you, Judy. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to talk to her in 15 minutes uh, or 10 minutes for that matter. It's uh, it's just sometimes you get a bit curious. So I will try and be uh, you know, exercise restraint. So um, this evaluation, as Stephen already said, um, was conducted last year from March to June. Um, it did involve more than 40 interviews with staff and uh, with stakeholders. Um, but very importantly, I was given unfettered access to de-identified data that Family PNG in its lay operations has collected right from the outset. And it was just the most fabulous data collection. I also had the advantage of having worked with Family PNG on a, another research project, Family Protection Orders, and I had spent some time in lay prior to doing the evaluation over a number of years. So that was very really useful too. So the- uh, Judy, sorry to interrupt again, but I just noticed like you are breaking up a bit. So I'll just, I think this happens sometimes with the share screen. So I just encourage people to turn your video off while we're doing the share screen. And then once we've been through the PowerPoint, we can all go back on video. Yeah. Um, sorry, Judy, back to you. That's okay. Um, I won't repeat what I just said. Um, you can see it on the screen anyway. And the, the purpose of the evaluation was to, um, to see whether Family PNG inlay had met it, the four strategic priorities that Family PNG had set itself. And those priorities have relate to service delivery, um, organizational resilience, and very importantly, the impact of the service on clients and the community more broadly. Um, the other thing I just wanted to really stress at the outset, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with LAY itself, 
or the wider Morobi province and Papua New Guinea, um, what a challenging, difficult and complex environment that is to work in as a service provider full stop, but also as, in particular as a, as a service that is um, aimed to support survivors of family and sexual violence. Um, there are very high rates of family and sexual violence and poor levels of personal and community safety. Lay is the second uh, largest urban centre in Papua New Guinea. It's a provincial centre, it's a significant port, and it's an access point to major roads in the highlands and along the north coast. So it's a very um, mixed population and, and often quite a mobile population that lives in Lay. It's, um, there's a poorly resourced and politicised public sector that's not peculiar to Lay, that's across the country. But Lay does have the advantage of a constellation of justice and health services, which includes the police courts and, and a major hospital. And there's also a number of other specialist family and sexual violence services, including a family support centre, which is attached to the hospital. Um, and which um, also assists survivors, um, though traditionally the centre in Lay has focused more, I think it's fair to say, on sexual violence survivors. The police have um, what's called a family and sexual violence, se family and sexual violence unit, and, and also um, they have a, a detective squad called the Sexual Offences Squad as well. And there have been a number of safe houses, so they've been um, closed at various junctures over the period of time that the evaluation occurred. Can you hear me okay now? How are we going? Yep, sounds great, thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, all good. So the, um, what, is, what I found really um, significant, I guess, was the really solid foundations that were established right from the get-go with this particular um, service. Um, as Stephen said, it's very much a Papua New Guinean non-government organisation and it had the advantage of having the support and direct input of a coalition of experts and senior leaders in both Australia and in Papua New Guinea. And the upshot of that was, um, as you'll see from the slide, a number of really critical things that con contributed to creating this solid foundation. There was a a relatively small team, but an experienced and smart skilled workforce and a CEO who were involved in setting up the service. There was the um, adoption of the case management practice model right from the get go. There was the uh, rigorous and detailed record keeping, which I've already mentioned in terms of the, the fabulous um, uh, data system that the service now has. And, a data set, I should say, rather than system. Um, there was a comprehensive design framework and um, very significantly a hybrid governance model, which I won't go into now, but um, I uh, you may want to ask questions about that later. And, and um, what in Papua New Guinea in terms is substantial funding um, from, from the outset. Now, this is where I tried to squish in probably 30 pages of the report into one slide, um, which was um, drawing a lot on the, um, that, the, the, the client statistics I've been talking about, um, did look at the trends over the six years. And this slide, it seeks to summarize um, some of the um, key information in relation to clients but also um, looked at um, annual reports and was, um, looked at the income of, um, of the service and, and, and the way the service has changed over time in terms of the types of activities it was delivering. And I think it's fair to say in the six years, it stayed very true to its core um, purpose, um, which is helping individual clients who are survivors of family and sexual violence. So if you look at the um, dot points in brown there, that relates to um, what the trends um, are in relation to the clients. So the monthly, average monthly intake 
has been fairly steady between 35, and to 35 to 46 per fiscal year. However, from about 2016, 17 onwards, um, the casework has become more intensive and longer term. There's, um, so there's an ongoing very large caseload that the caseworkers have, which is tip, who are typically assigned about 150 clients per annum. An in increasing proportion of the clients are walking if they contact the service directly. Uh, the numbers in, in emergency accommodation, which is largely um, the safe houses, um, have, um, have, have fluctuated and that relates more to the availability of places in safe houses. A very important trend um, has been an increasing number of clients who um, seek legal, legal assistance under the Family Protection Act that was introduced in 2013, but really wasn't implemented properly, I think it's fair to say, until 2017. Survivors can apply for an interim protection order um, from the district court, and uh, it's become increasingly a major part of one of the options that Family PNG offers to, to its clients. Uh, very few of the clients are offered repatriation back to wherever um, might constitute their home location. Um, though those cases can often be very complicated and long-term. At least 80% of the clients, and this has remained um, pretty consistent over the six years, are victims of domestic violence. And that certainly seems to have been increase in the uh, annual number of clients um, in more recent years, uh, an increasing uh, number of domestic violence survivors have sought out assistance from the service. And um, overwhelmingly, um, the clients are, are female, predominantly women, um, and that stayed pretty uh, has stayed consistent across the six years. Um, the growth in coming to the dot points in black, there's been an, um, a growth to meet the demand of, um, on the service from 12 to 26 staff. And uh, certainly there are more management and specialist positions. And there has been an income in the in, uh, increase in the income. Um, but um, where a large part of that increase has come from is from the non-DFAT sources. Um, and the other uh, change, I guess, in the way that Family PNG has worked and they has been an increasing involvement in training, community education, and awareness raising. And this is um, just summarised in the last dot point when in the last annual report that I looked at in for 2018-19, it was estimated that more than 35,000 people have been reached through awareness raising activities, which is a phenomenal number. So just moving on to the strategic priorities, one of the, the first one is to be a well-run and sustainable Papua New Guinean NGO. And um, certainly the evaluation found that, um, yes, it is. <laughs> there's a stable board membership and workforce. There's good governance practices. There's good human resources, policies and practices. There is very importantly, given where where the service um, operates and, and what it does. There's a prioritization of safety and security for both the clients and the staff. Very importantly um, is the passion, the skills and commitment of the board, the staff. Yes, the second strategic part priority relates to partnerships with other stakeholders to improve the effectiveness of responses. And um, I, I found in the through the evaluation that the relationships with local stakeholders have strengthened over time, though there have been difficulties along the way. Um, and what has really contributed to the strengthening in those relationships has been what the, um, the organization calls partner resourcing. And um, this is where Key agencies are assisted by Family PNG um, in, in rather in very practical ways, like to improve safe house amenities, to help the police and courts with supplies and equipment. The total proportion of expenditure on this partner resourcing has stayed relatively stable, 
and isn't a huge amount of the expenditure by the organisation, but in my view, has been really instrumental in improving those relationships, which are very personal. The other aspect of those relationships is the way certain individuals in other services have got to know key people in family of PNG and those personal relationships have really helped the way um, the sector as a whole has um, responded to helping survivors of family and sexual violence. And training of key stakeholders has also been a critical role that Family PNG has, has performed either um, they've de delivered it directly themselves or in collaboration with others. So um, the conclusion in the report is there is now widespread acceptance of the role Family PNG plays in the local family and sexual violence sector. There, were, um, there was some resistance in some quarters at, in the first few years. Okay, how am I going for time? Okay. Um, the, the next, the third goal. Doing well. Okay. <laughs> Thank <Yep>. you for coordinated <laughs> approaches to case management. And um, I, I think it is very, very uh, important that after six years, Family PNG has demonstrated in a very concrete fashion that case management provides an invaluable service to survivors. Staff practices are exemplary, um, and that the approach is it has shown that the approach take, taken is an effective form of case management. Um, the challenges challenges do remain, and they centre on the coordination of cases. There can be multiple referrals to and from other services, and it's not always very clear what's happened as a result of those referrals. Things can just, you know, not happen. And case conferences are, can be a very vital way to address complex, complex cases that are stalled. The, um, and, it's, and it's typically family PNG that will um, call those case conferences and bring the, bring the key parties together to talk about a case and to work out what can be done. The final strategic priority relates to operations and research-based advocacy to improve responses. And um, certainly the client advocacy um, was found to be um, based uh, on operational knowledge and experience, which is just essential. And those personal relationships I was talking about with key local service providers. There's certainly been that increase in the range and depth of outreach activities among the general pop population, though um, um, I concluded that it's it is hard to gauge the effect of those activities. Um, and the third area was low key, uh, I found was more low key and constrained in terms of system and policy advocacy. And I suspect we'll be talking a bit more about that later. So coming to the, you know, the big question is, has all this um, work had an impact? And um, uh, in terms of the impact on clients, um, all the indicators would show that yes, um, by and large, not necessarily all clients, but certainly the majority um, value highly the emergency and short-term assistance provided by Family PNG, and they really appreciate the practical help and the fact that they can be supported over an extended period of time, but also the respect that it is accorded to them by the Family PNG staff. So some of the indicators of the confidence and satisfaction with the service, I mean, Family PNG does its own client satisfaction surveys, but the numbers that participate are quite small. But ongoing demand and the number of um, clients who return to the service certainly show that there's a confidence there and appreciation of the service. And very importantly, the indicators that many are feeling safer as a result of their contact with, the, um, with Family PNG. Um, are the two mentioned above, but also that the reports of abuse um, uh, uh, by the clients of uh, reports of abuse and of violence after they've become a client of Family PNG uh, is much, much, much less than what they had experienced beforehand. And uh, certainly research that I've been involved in had showed um, that there was a much greater likelihood of an interim protection order, which is usually only for 30 days, um, 
is converted into a much longer term protection order, which can be up to two years. And that implies longer term and um, protection for the client as a result. In terms of the impact on local service providers, there's improvements in the way in, in um, access to justice and criminal justice responses. And there's, um, according to the, these uh, local service providers, it has improved their capabilities. It's freed them up to focus on other priorities. Um, they feel they're better informed and skilled. And this has resulted also in improved referral networks and coordination. Uh, in terms of the general public, in a way that it, not many appear to be aware of family PNG, um, but this could be oh, whoops, this could be due to the fact that um, uh, family PNG has to be very careful and very low key about it, where it's based and who its staff are and who its clients are. Um, but certainly, the um, evaluation found that. Um, that Family PNG has contributed to the public awareness of family and sexual violence and in interim protection orders in the past five years in lay. Mind you, that was coming from a very low, low base. So that a survey that I was involved in um, of young adults, which was done in lay in Port Moresby, found that in, um, in lay, 42% of the young adults surveyed were aware of interim protection orders and protection orders, which is um, Pretty phenomenal. Um, okay, and the impact on family and sexual violence policy and practice. Um, there's certainly been a high profile of family PNG among key stakeholder groups nationally and in Australia. I, this is very hard to put any sort of metrics around, but I do think it has acted as a model and a beacon for those who champion reform. And the fact that it has expanded as a service to Port Moresby and elsewhere um, has increased its nat national footprint, but also reflects the donor sector confidence and other supporters' confidence in the service. So here I summarise the, uh, the key achievements um, as I saw it of Family PNG's operations in, in, um, in LAE. Uh, and it's, um, you know, there's three here, three key ones, that it's, um, you know, a locally run and supported non-government organisation with local staff take, taking ownership and providing leadership. And has, there's been the creation of a skilled and disciplined workforce, which is no mean achievement. Um, it has provided improved access to services for survivors, by helping partners do their jobs and demonstrating the value of case management, which results in the clients making informed decisions. And it has created a ripple effect in the local and wider community with clients and participants in training and outreach activities becoming advocates against family and sexual violence. Final slide, everyone. These are the lessons learned. This primarily comes from those who work within family PNG. I was asking them what they felt they had learned. And as mentioned at the outset, a number of um, workers and certainly those in senior management positions, such as Daisy and Denga, have been there right from the get-go, from the beginning. And these dot points summarize um, what they felt they'd learned in the past six years I'd also mentioned Stephen as well. I, I, I interviewed board members as well, um, some of whom also have been involved right from the beginning. So the lessons learned included that it takes time to implement a service like this to adjust to the difficulties and unique aspects of the operating environment and to have an impact. Crisis orientation and the immediate help has been a core strength of the service to clients. More resources for corporate areas, such as human resource and financial management, were required at the outset. This is a kind of <laughs> what we wish we had done this, um, was the lesson learned there. And the explicit, explicit attention is required to core business and practices 
based on clearly articulated values and principles. Looking after the workforce is vital to the, vital to the well-being of the organisation and dedicated and specialist positions are required to, um, to ensure the right kind of communication activities uh, occur and to um, produce standardised approaches and content for training and community education. Legal expertise um, has proved central to the operations and there has been a lawyer who's worked within Family PNG um, for most of the six years and um, has, has, has been crucial in enabling um, Family PNG to offer the kind of legal assistance that clients appreciate. Uh, collaboration with local services providers requires continual ongoing investment and diplomacy, as you can imagine. Uh, it's important to embrace flexibility and taking advantage of opportunities. And though a complicated and detailed client database, this is the record keeping and the statistics it generates, um, creates a large administrative burden, it does help shape adherence to everyday good practice and is useful, as has been demonstrated in this evaluation, for monitoring, evaluation, reflection and research. So this is um, um, the link to, to the report. Um, so I would hope that some of you at least um, will read it. And I just love this photo of uh, one of the workers at Family, family PNG with a client. Okay. Great. Top sharing. Well, thanks very much, Judy, for that terrific uh, presentation and overview. And yeah, thanks to the Department of Pacific Affairs for publishing the report. Um, and you can also go to our website, familypng.org, and just look under resources. Uh, Judy, you did have a few recommendations, right? Do you want to briefly mention those before we go to Daisy and Dinger? Um, I could just sh share my, my screen again. Yeah. If you like. um, and just um, uh, I'll go through them very quickly because I'm sure um, if I can share properly. Yeah, just the little screen. Can you see anything at all? Yeah, if you click on the little screen icon at the bottom. Full screen? Okay. Yeah, that's it. Cool. And I'll go back to the beginning. Well, now you need to share the screen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we can we can see that. So. You can see that, all right? Oh. No, I lost it again. Yeah, no, just share it again. Okay. Yes. That's fine. That's fine. What a relief. So just briefly. Yes. Um, okay. So. Um, Very practical recommendations about acquiring land in a building in lay because it would, the building that's been used has been, um, anyway, I won't go into that. Improving opportunities for promotion and training and support for staff um, and reviewing caseloads regularly and prioritizing supervision. Um, um, redesigning the website and focusing on more support from the private sector. Agreeing on and collecting data on outcomes from outreach and training. Um, exploring future partnerships with other NGOs. Uh, recommends a research and advocacy plan, um, supporting the, the um, getting another safe house in lay. Um, more documentation of practices, as there is a risk um, that practice knowledge will be lost. Uh, explore how family counseling skills could be developed. Uh, what systems could be put in place to consolidate the relationships between agencies. Uh, investigate why the private sector is not uh, referring clients or not many clients to family PNG and lay. Um, continue to develop court, uh, short community education um, courses. Expand the work with and support for male advocacy and human rights um, defender networks and village court officials, especially in rural settings. Nearly finished. Develop a research agenda. Uh, agree on key indicators that should be monitored um, 
and consider, consider um, acquiring additional m and &E monitoring and evaluation information. And this is the management response, but I might leave that at, um, and leave it up to you, Stephen and Dinger and Daisy now to talk further. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Judy. So yeah, you've got the uh, full picture now of the evaluation. It was an independent evaluation. I do want to stress that. I uh, certainly take those recommendations very seriously. So now I think we have both Daisy and Dinger uh, online. So I'm going to hand over uh, perhaps to each of them in turn. So I do want to say we're very proud of our management, uh, well, our whole organization, but uh, especially the, the management, as uh, Judy said, uh, both Daisy, our CEO and Dinger, operations director, have been there uh, from the start. And in fact, they're working on a, another project together supported by MSF at Ango Hospital. It was out of that project that this family PNG uh, grew. And you know, now we've grown to about 60 staff and I, I haven't actually proven it, but I often say, and I think that you know, we are the largest female managed organization in Papua New Guinea. So you know, that is something. Um, so I might hand over to Daisy first and invite both Daisy and Dinger to respond to the recommendations, but also just add your own reflections uh, on the journey. Uh, Daisy uh, is originally from the Philippines, but I think is now sort of honorary Papua New Guinea has been living uh, in Lai for the last decade and um, has been the CEO of Family PNG since 2013. So good to see you, Daisy, and over to you. Hi, Stephen, thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you so much for the presentation of uh, Dr. Judy Put. And uh, yeah, for the last uh, seven years, uh, Family PNG has been uh, in quite uh, still a short journey, but a lot of things had happened in the last uh, seven years. Um, yeah, so um, uh, for, for the current uh, update of Family PNG right now. Um, we had been existing for seven years and uh, one of the recommendation that you just said is of course the premise. So um, yeah, uh, all this time, all through the uh, services that we are offering, we are still uh, leasing offices. So we are hoping actually that uh, Family PNG will be able to acquire a much more sustainable place in which we are already um, requesting the Morobe Provincial uh, Government to uh, offer us land for, for long term, at least to establish a much more sustainable office in the center for the survivors as well as to sustain our operation in much longer term. And uh, yeah, for the last seven years uh, from Lay, um, we have expanded our uh, programs to POM, uh, in POM, we have been operating uh, the Belize uh, Safe House plus Case Management for the last two years since 2018. And that is uh, um, uh, through the partnership of local and uh, private uh, partnership in Port Mosby. So we are also honored to be operating these services and allowing not only the public to acquire case management and safe house, but also uh, uh, serving as well the business houses and I think that is also part of the recommendation in which uh, we should be reaching out uh, for our um, for the survivors or clientele that belongs to uh, private sectors yeah so um, we just also open our Goroka uh, center under the community development um, and uh, it's not the same as lay and Port Mosby. Uh, it's another like a pilot study for Family PNG in trying to uh, see and uh, uh, evaluate what would be the another approach that we can uh, continue the case management in a way that it is uh, uh, sustainable and also uh, cheaper. So uh, this model is now also totally different because this is sitting under the community development and we have uh, only two case workers and they are working in collaboration and uh, hand in hand with the uh, community development officers under the uh, assistance of the community development advisor as well. So uh, that's another third uh, center that we are operating. And um, 
yeah, that is supported under the EU spotlight. But aside from the three centers that we are running right now, uh, we have also um, four more other provinces under the EU spotlight. So we have uh, Hela, we have Enga, East New Britain, and Southern Highland province uh, that we are uh, expanding also our uh, training program, uh, as I said, through the uh, UN spotlight. Uh, under UN Women and uh, UNDP. So most of the participants of the training that we are uh, targeting is basically the community leaders, the service providers, and uh, the police, basically, because these are the people that uh, the, 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 the frontliners in dealing and responding to our survivors from the very instance. So um, the hope of this training is not only to, um, to also educate some of our partners that there are already laws uh, protecting women and children, but it's also uh, hoping to um, address uh, the, the, the uh, service provision in every province to improve service provision to our survivors. So that's the current uh, work that we have and uh, the first phase will be uh, ending by uh, this uh, coming December 2021. So we're hoping to uh, have further discussion with you and Spotlight on uh, what will be the second phase for this program because we have seen that this is uh, a very good opportunity for us to, to work with service providers on the ground as well as also extending our services uh, to the survivors that um, mostly their life is at risk and requires uh, immediate uh, uh, assistance for safety. And um, yeah, so uh, we have also engagement with the KTP, the Kokoda Track Found KTF, the Kokoda Track Foundation in Oro. So currently we are uh, running some activities in schools, in the communities uh, through our outreach. And uh, yeah, we are hoping that uh, by next year we'll continue as well uh, this uh, uh, program uh, under that uh, partnership. And uh, uh, another activity that we are also um, doing the partnership is with the SDA Church in Lay. Um, we are uh, aware that somehow uh, safe houses, safe accommodations are quite limited. And in Lay right now, we have uh, one for children and uh, two for uh, women and children, but still we find it it's not enough. So, um, uh, we try to partner with SDA and uh, they are in the process of uh, completing the establishment and the building of the safe house. Hopefully soon Denga can provide us more feedback. Uh, hopefully in a month or two, uh, it will be totally complete. But it's really a, a work from the community, a work from the church, and also a work and support from other business houses such as OSF, Digicel, and uh, yeah, basically uh, some portion also from Family PNG. But the commitment of people, commitment of the church people to run the operations is great. And uh, this is how we would like to support sustainability as well. Uh, one NGO such as Family PNG can cover the rest, but we need more uh, people to take on board and take uh, um, commitment to, 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 to do more to our survivors. Yeah, so uh, from the perspective of the case management, as uh, uh, Judy presented, somehow it is quite uh, challenging. Cases are complex. Uh, also, the, the very challenging situations also of the service providers, the lack of resources. Uh, we had been through different uh, and ongoing challenges until now. Uh, things are, you know, uh, every day still changing when it comes to relationship, it comes to dealing with the survivors. But yeah, uh, we keep on learning as well by by working with the survivors. But uh, one thing that Family PNG is uh, uh, continuously trying to do best is um, the continuous development, the professional development of our staff, and uh, especially given uh, the situation that uh, uh, most of our social work uh, graduates in the country really don't have a um, 
exposure to this kind of work before. And when they start working with Family PNG, it's their first uh, experience. So uh, there's a lot of uh, work also in training that uh, requires to be given and provided on, on the regular basis. So before COVID, before we used to send them into other countries as well that have the same, uh, you know, uh, the minimum resources or the same context of PNG so they can see other approaches uh, in regards to working with the survivors. And we are hoping that uh, when things will be better, we can continue the kind of um, support to our staff. And uh, yeah, internally, we continue to provide training as well uh, to our staff, not only on the case management and for those ones, we have also refreshing courses for them every after two years and uh, yeah, um, associated with working with the survivors, one of the training as well that requires for our staff is the trauma informed care. So uh, basically, when we uh, receive clients. We hope that uh, we will not be re-traumatizing them, but we can offer the best approach, uh, the more the, the best uh, sensitive approach uh, from the doorstep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Basically, as the work is quite challenging, um, we also ensure that our staff have access for debriefing purposes. So it is also being done regularly uh, so that uh, all these challenges, all the cases that they are dealing with, uh, they can contain it in, in the workspace and allowing them still to continue leaving, going back home uh, and also uh, take another role as uh, mother or sisters and uh, children to their own family without being also affected with the story of the clients that we have. So I think that's uh, partly for me and I will allow either Denga or Fiona to continue. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Daisy. It was great you were able to sort of mention the range of uh, endeavors and partners uh, we're now working with. Um, I think unfortunately uh, we've lost uh, Denga uh, again, so I think I should have gone to her first actually when she was online. I think she's got unstable internet, so we're not going to be able to go to her uh, at least right now. Uh, but that means uh, we've got um, the, the upside is we do have a bit of time for questions. So I encourage you to um, ask your questions. Please put up your hand, um, you know, if you'd like to ask a question or put a question in the chat uh, function. In fact, we do have a uh, I've got a couple of messages, um, so I might just read them out and maybe uh, I'll ask either Judy or Daisy to answer them. Uh, Peter Colbatch has a question saying that um, when she was involved in PNG as professor of surgery, found that the main reason for emergency admission to hospitals from domestic violence, had there been links developed with Angau and other health services and their improvement? So that's one question. I'll just give them both and then and then there's a question uh, from, uh, I, from Lani from the IFC uh, about client outcomes. Has access to family PNG helped clients remain in employment? And then, okay, one more question for now uh, from Bessie. Uh, with your extensive experience in case management, what would be your recommendations for key support services that's lacking and for partners to invest in? So a question about links to health, questions about employment outcomes, and then recommendations for key support services. Uh, Judy, do you want to go first and then we'll go to Daisy? Um, I think Daisy would be a better place to answer two of those questions. I can make a comment about the um, um, employment outcomes. Um, I know that it, you could look at it potentially from the uh, the, the uh, client data. Um, it's not something um, I recall looking at um, in any detail and nothing strikes me. I don't remember that many clients actually being in what might be called paid employment, but correct me if I'm um, giving the wrong impression there. Stephen and Daisy, again, may be in a better position to comment. No, I think that's right, Judy. I think uh, the POM, uh... Centre has more of a focus mm -hmm. on formal sector employees because they're linked to the private sector. And that is something actually, in fact, the IFC is helping us do an evaluation of that. So we may be able to answer that question a bit further down the road. But Daisy, what about the links to the health sector? We actually, and the, the 
story about how we grew out of Angar Hospital? Uh, yeah, basically it, it was, uh, the question is uh, the back then 1990s, so um, the, um, the program of Family Support Center actually uh, has been supported by uh, Doctors Without Borders from the international uh, organization, and I hope that uh, that basically uh, the link, uh, that's the reason why the Family and Support Center has been established uh, way back then, and uh, yeah, and and uh, I think uh, um, it's also connected now for all the district health centers and when they try to also um, train much more uh, health centers on in the different districts in regards to addressing family and sexual violence. But basically, perhaps that's come from that uh, yeah, reporting. What, what are your recommendations for key support services for partners to invest in? Yeah, I I, uh, I support that, and uh, I think uh, um, what we felt case management basically is an approach that requires a strengthening of all the sectors on the ground, uh, not only of the NGOs, but uh, we need the police, uh, we need the court, uh, we need um, the welfare, and uh, simultaneously and parallelly, it should be strengthened and resourced properly because, um, yeah, these are the much more sustainable uh, services that the survivors could access. NGO may close and shut down after the after all the funding that we receive, but uh, this institution should uh, continue and should continue and and will continue and to be able to to continue the work for the survivors. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Daisy. Yeah, I'll just add actually in terms of just going back to Peter's question and the health link. Um, yeah, to, in fact, uh, what happened was uh, this Daisy and Denga were both working at that Angal Family Support Centre in the hospital. And they noticed, and a, another colleague from ANU, Dr. Camelini Lokuge, confirmed through her evaluation. In fact, a lot of the um, clients were coming to that health centre, not necessarily because they had health needs, but it was the only place they could go uh, when they had when they were experiencing domestic violence. So it was out of that that came this idea that we needed a broader a centre with a broader remit, you know, not just health, um, but that could work uh, flexibly depending on what the client needed. And yeah, for the first couple of years, uh, nearly all our clients actually came from the Family Support Centre. Um, over time, we've diversified and now they come from a range, you know, from the police and, and a lot of them just come directly to the office now, but still the uh, health centre is a significant source of our clients. So that's um, that relationship is developed in that way. Uh, we're still getting some more questions. Um, so Zoe Neal's asking, what were the key strengths of the data collection system? Uh, Amanda's asked about um, how COVID has impacted on our work, which is a very critical question and critical issue. And um, Rochelle's asking about the clinical guidelines for GBV and how we're going to uh, use those. Um, and Ian about uh, areas in need to explain further uh, about the uh, need for coordination and referrals. Anyway, you can see uh, Judy and uh, Daisy, there are actually so many questions. Mm. Um, I'll just leave it to you to respond as you see fit. Yeah, I think uh, what... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Judy. That's all right. I'll just jump in and answer the data question and I'll okay. leave that's okay, Daisy. That's fine. <laughs> so the, in, in, in response to that question about the data collection, it, um, as I flagged, it was set up right from the, um, the beginning and Camelini, who Stephen mentioned, was instrumental in setting that up. It, um, it means that information is collected as soon as there's contact with a prospective client. And then once uh, a, a person is a client, the information is recorded at, at critical junctures. And this has built up an absolutely enormous and comprehensive um, amount of information about the work of um, Family PNG, but centered on the work um, that 
directly involves clients rather than uh, the, the training and the community education side of it. When I first realised how much information is recorded and how much time that must take, I guess my initial reaction was, my goodness, this is such a burden. But then talking with, uh, with the workers and with Daisy and Zenga, um, they feel they felt that it has helped them shape what they do. They've um, it's regularly provided information to them. So it may, uh, if I was starting a service, I'm not sure I would be quite so comprehensive in the amount of information that's being collected because of the uh, then the investment that then had needs to be made to make sure it's done um, regularly, that it's analysed um, is, is is a lot. Um, and it's all credit to Family PNG that it's managed to do that and, and, and make the most of it. But it is a big, significant and ongoing investment. Um, and, and it's, I guess, um, whoever is involved in a service has to look at the pros and cons of that. Based on the other work I've done in Papua New Guinea, I guess what really strikes me about the Family PNG data is the reliability of it. The fact that it has actually been um, kept up and it is routinely recorded and there is a, a reliability that is hard to find um, in other services. Over to you, Daisy. I'll leave all, all the other questions to you. <laughs> Thanks, Trudy. Daisy, maybe just uh, focus on COVID because I'm sure people want to know about that. And then I think other questions we might, uh, people who are interested, we can stay back and chat a bit because we, we're mm -hmm. running out of time and I want to leave yeah, time for okay. the High Commissioner. That's fine. Yeah, so uh, for the uh, how COVID-19 impacted us, uh, yeah, uh, we never closed our centres. We had been operational to date since COVID started. Uh, we may have some... Uh, uh, lesson hours from time to time. Uh, yeah, but basically uh, from the operation side, um, yeah, we continuously uh, open. However, I think the access to the survivors are the one being affected. But uh, from the website and uh, other promotions we are doing that even the survivors cannot uh, come in person, they can still access our caseworkers either by email, phones, or other media platform. Yeah, so some of the business houses as well, they may not be able to uh, come now, especially at this current situation. Um, however, uh, we are trying to also uh, improve on how they can access through Zoom, uh, even they are just in the office. So uh, that's the impact of the survivors. And for the service providers, I think we have some delays of, of some uh, some responses from our service providers because we understand too that uh, their human resource or staffing may be limited and some may be uh, fall sick at this time of the uh, pandemic. So there, there's quite a, a delay when, when receiving some uh, services from partners. But those are um, understandable at this uh, very moment. Yeah, so that's the impact of COVID. And I think from the question from Rochelle, uh, we will be, if that is finalized and if the NDOH will be allowed us to do that, uh, we can also put that on board as one of the topic for the training uh, package. And uh, yeah, I think uh, with the current range that Family PNG can reach, and uh, also we have discussion and talk in the community, in district and other provinces, they are willing to learn and they are willing to be trained under this. So I think uh, we can put it on board. We, we have the issue for that. More people to learn how to respond to survival is much better. Yeah, so. All right, thanks Daisy. I think uh, the other questions, sorry, we haven't had time, but I do encourage you just to stay on, but we won't close the call. And after we formally close, we can just have a continue informal uh, discussion. Um, because we are we are out of time now, but um, do please stay for uh, the closing remarks. So I'd like to call on John Carley, the High Commissioner of Papua New Guinea to Australia. Uh, John's also a very distinguished uh, public servant and uh, well known in, in PNG as a gender equity champion. And, and we're honored that uh, he has agreed to be our patron. Uh, so thanks very much for joining with us John, I'll, I'll yeah. hand over to you. For yeah, thanks, uh, 
Stephen, and, and I understand you are the chairman of the board. Can you hear me? Yes, we can't. We can't see you, but we can. Yeah, hear you. unfortunately, I have some issues with my laptop, so uh, I'll be the ghost. Oh, that's fine. You're coming through loud and clear, so that's fine. All right. But thank you, uh, firstly, Stephen, for the opportunity to uh, uh, address uh, you and also the other members of the panel there. But most importantly, for the two speakers, Dr. Judith Put, uh, for her wonderful. Uh, uh, analysis of what's happened over the last six years, but more particularly for Daisy, uh, you know, giving us the really pragmatic uh, things which are happening on the ground. And, uh, you know, to, to be quite honest, I'm, I'm really privileged to be part of this wonderful organization uh, and listening to all the work that's been done uh, is really moving, uh, to say the least. Uh, and being away from home, uh, I wish I could be back in Papua New Guinea uh, to, you know, get on the ground and, uh, get, you know, roll my sleeves up and, you know, really do something practical uh, rather than sitting on the top as the patron. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really uh, appreciative uh, of, of those uh, uh, the, the speeches that were given uh, this morning. I, I am... Um, very, very much uh, into thinking strategically. Uh, and some of the things that uh, Dr. Put uh, has uh, identified, I, I would really love to read the, you know, the report. But in, in short, uh, in strong governance uh, is really important. A good board, uh, you know, with the good strategies uh, and you, you outlined a number of strategies which I'm really supportive of, but particularly in relation to partnerships. Uh, our, our organization is growing, uh, and I see that uh, you know we are also growing very, very much at the top. But I, I really think we should be really growing at the bottom level, where the service delivery really matters. And you've identified some of the key issues about. Uh, practical approaches for social workers uh, in terms of booklets on uh, you know processes and procedures on how they can do their work in terms of case management. Uh, you know it's really really uh, wonderful to see that uh, uh, report. Uh, I really uh, would like to help uh, with the Morobi provincial government and with the Eastern Islands Provincial Government and also the central uh, the NCD governors at the political level. Uh, so I will take up some of the uh, concerns and recommendations that you raised there and uh, you know, use my uh, connections to see if we can uh, uh, get the support at the government level. Uh, because uh, the government has got a long arm uh, and you know, in partnership with the, with the an effective work in NGO, uh, we can uh, you know, achieve a lot of the results that uh, we want to aspire to achieve. We we are dealing with a very major uh, disease in Papua New Guinea, uh, domestic violence, and I I have experienced a lot of uh, young girls and young women back from where I come from. But it's having access to advice and services uh, from the government that is selecting. And so for an NGO like a family PNG to fill that gap is wonderful. Uh, but we need to get uh, resource uh, support in terms of uh, human resource, uh, in terms of financial management. Uh, and those are key uh, resources that uh, we really need. Uh, I will do my best in my capacity as High Commissioner to Australia to continue to secure the support of the Australian government. Uh, and uh, the recently signed uh, CSET, the Comprehensive Strategic Economic Partnership, uh, both uh, the Prime Minister signed up last year, identifies gender as a key priority for both governments. And I think we must take advantage uh, of this long-term 10-year agreement 
and look at how we can uh, use uh, the family PNG uh, working with uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the two governments to be able to um, achieve results on the ground. Uh, but, you know, Stephen, I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, address these uh, wonderful people there and to know that uh, Family PNG is uh, uh, the largest female managed NGO in Papua New Guinea really pleases me. Uh, and uh, I, I really want to congratulate Daisy, uh, who's uh, working on the ground there. Uh, and uh, to know that uh, this is an organization that's owned by Papua New Guineans is also very pleasing. So Stephen, uh, thank you to your board uh, and uh, your management uh, for accepting me as your patron. And I'll do whatever I can uh, from where I am to, to make sure that Family PNG extends uh, its services uh, and you know become uh, an organization uh, that uh, helping the, the needy people of Papua New Guinea. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, John, for those words and and for your support, which is really important. Uh, and I will just say, you know, we talked about growing partners, and of course, one of our long-term goals is to get funding from the PNG government, and we have actually made our first steps in that direction. We are now getting funding, still limited, but we have got funding both at the national level and in one of the districts where we work. So that's a significant progress. Uh, and, what uh, if we Stephen, are out of sorry, time? Stephen, yeah. we, we also are doing some work on the ground here at the High Commission, as you probably know, uh, to try and you know do some fundraising activities uh, in Canberra. So I, I want to uh, ask uh, those people who are available to come forward and uh, Let's, uh, you know, uh, have a presence in, uh, in Canberra. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's, great. that's great. Yes, that's quite right. And we do have this support organisation in Australia called Friends of Family PNG. And um, yeah, we've got lots of uh, exciting initiatives underway and under preparation. And um, we'll be bringing those to you soon. Uh, please do, if you're interested, please get in touch with us uh, for that. But as I said, we are out of time. In fact, we've gone out of time. So I think formally I'm going to bring proceedings to a close. But I do invite anyone who's interested, anyone who's put a question up that hasn't been answered. And in fact, I see that Denga is uh, actually now being able to join us again. So perhaps anyone who wants to have a chat or hear from Denga, uh, do stay on and we could just continue informally uh, for a little bit uh, once uh, we close the formal proceedings. Uh, but I will do now do that. So thank you, every, everyone, for who's... Um, made the time to come along today. Thank you, Judy, for your excellent evaluation and your recommendations and your presentation today. Uh, thank you, Daisy, uh, for your contribution. Uh, sorry, Denga, we weren't able to hear from you, but glad you've been able to join uh, now. Uh, thanks, of course, to the High Commissioner. Thanks to uh, Fiona and the team who organized uh, today's event. And finally, I just want to say, you know, it's nice to see so many familiar names. And uh, thanks to everyone, whether you're on our staff uh, here in Australia or PNG, current staff, uh, former staff, uh, supporters over the years. Uh, thank you, uh, one and all. Uh, so now I'll close, but um, do stay if you're interested uh, to hear more. Thank you. <laughs>